my idea was actually to extend this triangle northward, so to speak. That's right, I believe we can see more of this triangle by deducing what the numbers would be above this first one. Hello, fellow mathematicians. I have an idea I wanted to share about Pascal's triangle. This is, of course, the famous triangle, probably developed in ancient China or ancient India, created when we begin with one at the center here, and we continue to, to add adjacent numbers to find the result. Now, in this case, we, we're just going to add two ones in this row, but in, in the third row, we're going to have one, two, one. And then we'd add these two and get three, and get three, and add, again, ones to the left and right. And so that's how we generate numbers in the following row. So it's, it's kind of recursive in this fashion. A recursive definition where the number in any arbitrary row is just the sum of, like, these above two numbers. of the previous row. Now this is actually an infinite process, and so we can keep going indefinitely, adding numbers to find the terms of the next row, and it turns out that this is also incredibly important and useful, actually, in what is called the binomial theorem which determines, basically, the coefficients of a binomial expansion. For instance, if we have uh, something like the quantity a plus b to the seventh, and we wanted to, basically, simplify this expression here, or, you know, kind of expand it to, to see what this actually equals, we can use Pascal's triangle, and what we would do is actually look at the seventh row, and use these numbers as the coefficients of each term of the expansion. So this one would be equal... We would have a to the seventh, since this first coefficient is one, and then we'd say plus seven a to the sixth times b, plus, and then we go to the next coefficient, 21, a, to the fifth times b squared, and we continue in this fashion, we, we actually continue this pattern, where the coefficient of a decreases uh, until it gets to zero, and b, you know, from the first term onward, uh, is going, you know, the, the exponent of b is going zero, one, two, all the way up to, eventually, it's going to be seven. But for this one, we get uh, 35a to the fourth b cubed, and then we get a 35 a to the third b to the seventh or b to the fourth, and we can still even continue in this fashion. So clearly, each of the numbers in that row of Pascal's triangle is being used in the polynomial expansion. I have some good memories of learning about Pascal's triangle from a friend in a book. In my spare time, several years ago, people, not just mathematicians often value these pleasant memories of learning without the burdens of exams and the stress of busy lives. But anyways, my idea was actually to extend this triangle northward, so to speak. That's right, I believe we can see more of this triangle by deducing what the numbers would be above this first one. And so where I started, we can actually consider this to be... We can consider this kind of arbitrary line that divides the triangle into two halves. And this is really the symmetry, so to speak, uh, of this triangle, where basically uh, a number to the left, you know, an arbitrary length, or an arbitrary distance to the left of this symmetry line will be equal if it were reflected. You know, there's a 1 here and a 1 on the right, because they must be equal. There's, there's a 6 here, and similarly there's a, a 6 to the right of the line on, on this same row. Um, so basically, 
we can use that fact to our uh, to our advantage in this expansion because we know that there is let's you know assume there is some number here and some number here uh, above the first one so to speak so one is the sum of these two numbers so we know that a plus b equals one and we also know due to the symmetry that a is equal to b well in that case there's only one solution then and that solution is where a and b both equal one half so now this is very interesting now furthermore if we assume that all of these other rows are filled with zeros, which I think is probably a reasonable assumption, then using this information we can build the rest of the triangle. So for instance we can find what number occupies this cell by considering whatever zero minus one half is. Well that is just negative one half. And in this case zero minus negative one half is simply positive a half. And we can continue this pattern, get negative one half here, positive one half, and turn, it turns out that this whole entire row above, quote unquote, the first one, is actually just alternating between negative one half and positive one half. Except, of course, and you know, we get kind of one exception, which is this central, you know, one half, one half to sum up to one. And then one can sort of continue these deductions about Pascal's triangle in order to build it upward and basically what I've seen is that we can essentially choose any number so I, I just called it D in this case and it turns out that we can represent every other number in these rows in these, these subsequent rows as a function basically of D or at least it, in, in these two rows, as, as we'll see. And then basically we have one half minus d in this particular cell, seeing as we get, you know, d plus one half minus d equaling one half. And then we can continue this in this fashion. And it turns out that each of these rows is kind of an infinite row. And of course, it still maintains the symmetry, where the number to the left of this central variable is equal to that of the right. But basically, we know that the terms of this infinite row, based on this variable... Actually, I'll, let me just show you this. So if there's a cell that is an even number of units away from the central variable and basically and we, we call that K let's say it's the arbitrary cell is 2K units from the central variable well then we know that this you know the value of that cell will, will value value of that cell will be D minus K but if it's an even number after the central variable then the value will be 2k plus 1 over 2 minus d. So it'll be something of this form, and it basically alternates between something of this form and something of the d minus k form. So it's very interesting. We can also continue this pattern and move further upward, and we know that this then must be 1 half times the central variable, and so, so is this one, because they, they're equal and they sum to the, that central variable. And we continue this. And you can see what I've developed over here. And so, here's the row with the central variable. And if we go kind of up one step, then we get 1 half d, 1 half minus 3 halves d, 5 halves d minus 3 halves, 3 minus 7 halves the, and we continue this general pattern, which might not be obvious at first, but we can kind of analyze this, which I've tried to do right here. And so basically what this is describing is that each cell in this row contains a multiple of this central variable and a constant. And so I've listed these out, one after another, in order to find the pattern between them. And so the multiple, I say, 
is of the form negative 1 to the x times the quantity 2x plus 1 all over 2 times d. And then the constant, which was slightly more difficult to identify, but basically we know that it alternates between positive and negative. We get a positive 1 half, a negative 3 halves, a positive 3, a negative 5. But it turns out there is a pattern to this because it is actually a quadratic regression, at least uh, of the magnitudes of these numbers. They form a quadratic regression of the form 1 4th x squared minus 1 4th x. And that's very interesting. We can kind of see a graph of that. And we can see how the magnitudes are increasing over kind of over time. Now we also know that the, the signs, as I said before, are actually alternating, so we can incorporate that into our function. But anyways, I started to continue this up to the uh, following row, and I'm going to need a little bit more time to determine what this is. But thank you for listening. If you have any ideas, questions, or comments, let me know, and I'll see you next time.